Good morning, everyone. I'd like to uh, call the uh, Housing and Community Services Agency uh, meeting to order. Today we have a work session. It's uh, Wednesday, December the 9th. I'd like to start out by saying that Chair uh, Char is uh, ill this morning, and we are expecting both you and uh, uh, Sid to show up uh, hopefully shortly. So, But with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, are there any adjustments to the agenda this morning? Nope. Well, then we'll get right into the work session. And the first item is item A, which is the HACSA 2016-2020 strategic plan. Let's turn it over to Jacob. Um, well, thanks for giving us the opportunity to do a work session today. And I think we have two really important um, agenda items to discuss with the board today and get your input on. Uh, the first is the HACSA strategic plan. And, and um, some members of the current board um, were really actively involved in developing what we think is a um, best practice strategic plan in 2010. Um, I'm sorry, did my Yeah, we were going to Oh, okay. Okay. Um, yeah. um, so um, our strategic plan is different than other strategic plan in that um, there are um, time-bound and measurable goals. And that strategic plan is um, sunsetting on December 31st of 2015. And as you know, over the last few months, we've been working hard on updating this strategic plan. And that new strategic plan will carry us through 2020. Um, and um, this summer, uh, I moved into the executive uh, director position, as you all know. And Valerie moved into the deputy director position. And Valerie, as a deputy, has really led this process. And I'm going to turn it over to her at this time. Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce our consultants. Uh, we have here Sarah Stewart, Joe Bully, Wesley Lucas, and sitting in the back we have Bob Chauquette. Uh Bob is a professor of the strategic planning class that um, our consultants, our students in this class. And part of their classwork is to um, step out into the community and find an agency that needs help with its strategic plan. That was us. We were lucky to have this fabulous match. I was going to take the first few minutes to brag about our current uh, strategic plan, but I'll, I'll let that go since it's in the memo and Jacob's already done it. And um, and the, the document that the consultants have prepared for us talks all about the process. And uh, so rather than repeat any of that, I'll just let them go right into their presentation. Can we pull that, possibly pull that door shut? Thank you. Okay, so more in-depth introductions. Okay, um, we were wondering if it might be useful to do more in-depth introductions just so you have, have some clue who we are uh, beyond <laughs> students. <laughs> um, <laughs> students affiliated with Bob, who <laughs> we'll see. Um, I just saw it as Bob. Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm Wesley, and um, I'm, I'm working on concurrent master's degrees in conflict and dispute resolution and nonprofit management. Um, and so my focus areas are in facilitation, stakeholder engagement, uh, board governance, and uh, sort of related fields. Um, so this has been a real treat for me because uh, the opportunity to work with 60 stakeholders uh, has been phenomenal. Um, so that's, that's me. All right. Um, my name is Jopa. Um, abbreviation of that is J-O-P-A for all of you wondering. So uh, my name is Jopa. I'm a uh, second year uh, nonprofit management student at the University of Oregon. Um, I've worked with um, collective impact organizations in the past. In particular, um, this past summer, I worked with an organization called the St. Paul Promise Neighborhood. Um, and they were really studying how education affects um, educational outcomes, how chronic homelessness can really affect a child's ability to learn. And so that's what kind of got me interested into housing policies. And um, when the HACSA approached us and asked us to do a strategic plan for them, I was really excited to learn more about how does housing work, how does public housing work, and how does uh, Section 8 work. So um, I've been, you know, had a great opportunity to learn, and I'm really excited about what we have. I'm Sarah Stewart. Um, I'm also a second year Master of Nonprofit Management student. My day job is working at Kids First and the Deputy Director there, and we are Lane County's Child Abuse Intervention Center, for those who don't know. Um, I knew nothing really about housing before starting this project, so this has been really fun. What I do know is that um, stable housing is a protective factor when it comes to keeping kids safe from being abused, and so I've really enjoyed getting to learn more. 
Good to see you guys. Um, so quick introduction. Um, these are sort of the, the methods that we use. Um, first and foremost, we uh, the method that uh, Bob was having us use was what's known as SWAT. I imagine many of you are familiar with it. It's basically strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And we used that as a format for the 28 stakeholder direct interviews that we did. Um, we also did uh, three focus groups um, with different populations, one of which was with partners of HAXA, which uh, Jacob and Valerie facilitated. We also did um, an employee focus group, which uh, the group of consultants facilitated, and we, uh, we did another one with employees of HAXA, uh, which was formatted the same way. Um, we kicked off with a meeting with senior managers, um, uh, directors of divisions and that sort of thing, and uh, that was very informative in and of itself. All told, as I mentioned, we had 60 stakeholders involved in this process, um, which is about triple as many as any other group in our <laughs> class had, um, which was uh, which was really cool. Um, the the results of the of of those um, interviews, focus groups, and, and other RE strategies, um, I believe are um, best conveyed in this format, but we're going to go into in depth on each of these. You don't have to try and parse out those tiny words. Um, but basically, strengths are seen as both an internal, um, within internal, um, what's the word here that I'm looking for? Environment. Environment, thank you. Um, and, and positively oriented. Um, and you'll see that there's quite a few of those. Um, Weaknesses are internal environment, negative orientation, opportunities are the external environment, things that are going on beyond the agency, um, and uh, with a positive spin, uh, and then threats are external to the organization and a negative spin. Uh, so each of these we'll go into in a bit more detail, but you'll notice that there's there's a rough parity between each of the areas. Um, and we, we came to these uh, to these words that are in this matrix um, by basically distilling all of the raw data from our interviews and our focus groups down into theme areas uh, and putting it together in this way. Um, none of these topics appeared less than three times. Um, some of them appeared 15 to 30 times. Um, but in many cases, it was a direct repetition of the same concept, uh, whereas the ones that appeared three times were often some nuance of, of a concept, and so they appeared uh, important as well. So um, starting off, oh, nuts. Um, so strength, most of these, if we were to put numbers about the times that things were said, would be up like at least 30 to 40 most of these things. There were a lot of strengths talked about. Um, we tried to distill all 60 people's strengths listed into these kind of vague categories, but essentially what people said is that Taxa does really great work, um, their programs are awesome, and that they have a lot of influence and a great reputation in the community. We know that um, there's still a big section of the community that doesn't know about the work that you're doing, but they know the people who do know recognize that you do it really well. Um, Property development was definitely listed as a strength. Staff, especially leadership staff and um, development staff. And the new executive director was listed, I think it was like 27, 28 times mm -hmm. as a strength. Most people, everyone I talked to mentioned it, but most people really talked about that staff as well. Um, the partnerships and the strengths of the collaborations were also listed as a strength. I think that I talked about most things up there. I think the last one has to do with um, financial decision making. And so um, when HUD doesn't fund you guys at necessary levels, which is pretty often, um, people recognize that you don't make financial decisions lightly, um, that you are taking into account resident services before you're making any cuts, and that you're actually taking into account partnerships as well, and so partners spoke to that as a huge strength to invest in what you have. Um, and so I'll take on weaknesses. Um, I think a lot of folks that I talked to were kind of external stakeholders, um, and then we also heard a lot of input from employees who thought that the organization could do better in these areas. 
um, among them were um, customer service and branding recognition. Now, outside stakeholders had a lot to say about this. They said, you know, HACSA does such great work, but nobody knows about what the, the, the work that they're doing. Um, along with recognition, employees also spoke to that by saying, you know, it's kind of like a detriment to our morale when nobody else knows the great work that I know my coworkers and my colleagues bring into this organization um, and the services that we're providing for the community. Um, and so this, a lot of those uh, concepts are tied together um, and they kind of build from um, pretty strong weaknesses there. Um, there's also um, stagnant and declining funding, and so we recognize that you know funding is really based on the political and economic environment, um, and a lot of people uh, listed that as something that a HAPSA should just always be aware of, um, and so in our strategic plan, we'll address that a little bit about how we can um, kind of take that out as a characteristic of HAPSA so that people can actually focus on their work. Um, staff also asked for more training, um, especially about uh, cultural competency, uh, especially about safety and um, crisis communication. Um, staff also said that, you know, often we're working with very vulnerable populations who have extra needs, um, and very often we don't have the necessary trainings that, like, a social worker might have in order to um, help residents uh, move into our, our homes and move out of our homes. Uh, and so they wanted more training on those concepts, and they wanted to know how to best serve the, the community. Uh, and lastly, talking about customer service and stakeholder communication, there's um, a lot of landlords that I talk to in the community who are proponents of public housing in Section 8 who said um, that HACSA could do a better job of educating them about what does the Section 8 process look like, what are their rights and duties as landlords, um, and providing homes for uh, folks who are using Section 8 vouchers. And, um, and so they, they, and I think on page 9 there was this kind of comical quote. Someone said, you know, HACSA uh, communicate customer service is kind of like Comcast sometimes, you know, and we want, we want to communicate with them, but we don't always get the, what we need back. And so um, we decided to include that just for a little bit of comedy, um, but I think that it shows that, you know, HACSA has a lot uh, has a lot to offer and people want to continue working with HACSA. Um, communication just needs to be improved. Black comedy. <laughs> <laughs> um. While this is up here, and I recognize that, uh, so the two at the bottom are financial decision making and stakeholder communications. Are there any questions um, about the strengths or weaknesses at this moment? Any any check in you wanted to have with what we've just talked about? And these are the internal. And the this would be. This is more the internal environment. This is Haxa itself, as opposed to the environment in which Haxa is operating. Um, I just offer a little bit of perspective, and just want to go on record to say. You know, particularly around customer service, that, that is a top priority for me. Um, and how we treat um, the people we serve, how we treat our business partners, our landlords, um, and how we treat our partners is, is really important. I think we do a good job with um, our partners. Um, but, but what I would say is that, for me, my experience is that middle management and even some senior management positions um, didn't make customer service a priority. Um, and that was something I've been aware of um, since I got there, and I've been sort of chipping away at. Um, and I was not surprised at all that it came up in the stakeholder interview. And, you know, I had complaints um, from community members soon after I started that, you know, I've called so-and-so, and this, this is a, you know, a senior manager, and I never get a return call from that individual. Um, most of those folks no longer work at the agency. Um, and part of what we're doing is recreating management team expectations um, and customer service is a high priority. And because the uh, management didn't make customer service a high priority, that impacted line, line staff's mentality. So we're really making a big um, cultural shift within the organization around customer service. Um, and as a, the leader of the agency, I can't, you know, obviously I can make my expectations clear to managers, and I've done that. But getting um, that mindset changed at the employee level takes a little bit more time, and it takes some training and some expectation setting, which is something that we're in the process of doing. So do know that this is an area that I, I will follow up on with some strategic surveying probably about a year from now. And um, I have every expectation that when we do some surveying a year from now, that I'll be able to bring back to the board um, documentation. Uh, just a quick question. Thanks, Jacob. I, you know, customer service is the ultimate measurement of uh, success, uh, whatever your line of business. And uh, customer service is the difference between Gary's and Home Depot. Mm -hmm. 
So just a, my quick question is, who do you define as your customers? I mean, for me, the, cu- the customer is, is, is really everyone that we work with. So it's our low-income program participants, both in Section 8 and in the housing division. It's our landlords. Um, it's our partners, and it's our fellow employees. So for me, the term customer is really robust, and it's er- it includes everyone we interact with. Thank you. That, I was hoping I believe it would be a clever way to say Thank you. Um, any other questions before we move on to opportunities and threats? Um, so opportunities we're probably going to get into in a lot more detail when we explore the actual uh, objectives that we're working with here. Um, but the basic stuff that came out of this, at the bottom, which I don't believe you can even see, uh, it says hot public political issue. Um, one of the main things that emerged from this, the SWOT interviews and the focus groups is that right now housing is very in the news. It's very, uh, it's something that people are paying attention to in a way that they might not have been five years ago, might not have been even two years ago. Um, and so the, the external environment presents a lot of opportunities. Uh, that's one of the main things things that emerge. The other thing, just below accessibility of services that you can't see, is housing innovation. Um, There's a lot of interesting things that are going on in the world of housing. There's a lot of uh, new solutions to old problems um, that HAXA is participating in uh, and some that HAXA is not yet participating in. Um, And so those are also, that that environment uh, is is fertile ground. Um, Some of the major opportunities that were identified were um, HAXA has a strength, a recognized strength and their partnerships. Um, And many partners that we spoke with, uh, many uh, people uh, who who are current residents of HAXA, uh, either Section 8 or public housing, um, or um, employees also recognize that there are more opportunities for service partnerships, particularly for sort of continuum partnerships, handoffs, that sort of thing. Uh, Referral systems that are a little bit more um, uh, robust than they currently are. Um, and that that could do a lot, especially in a reduced funding environment like is happening with HUD, um, to deliver better outcomes without a huge amount of in additional investment. Um, there's There were opportunities for outreach into the community, things like political advocacy, community education, uh, marketing and branding, uh, and overall just increasing the accessibility of access services. Um, We'll get into this in a little bit more detail in a bit, but um, one of the main themes that we that we noticed uh, from talking with people is that uh, Pax has got a huge amount of leverage in the community. It's with with uh, I, I'm losing the exact number here, but I think it's about 5,000 residents, um, largest housing provider around, in, and that gives a lot of potential to uh, influence the environment of what's going on in Lane County and in Oregon. Um, so we'll get into the details in a bit, uh, but the the the, out, the external communications opportunities are pretty profound, uh, is what many of our stakeholders seem to indicate. Um, zeroing in for a moment just on client self-sufficiency, uh, this was a very interesting topic in terms of there were a lot of folks who said HACSA could be doing more to get people off their programs. There were also a lot of folks who said HACSA could be doing more to keep people who need to stay on their programs supported while they're on their programs. So that's that's sort of a very complex three words um, in terms of it's not just getting clients off programs. It's not just keeping clients who are on programs supported while they're there. Um, there's a lot to that, uh, and we'll get into that again in a little bit um, with more detail. In terms of threats that people talked about included the board structure. Um, and this is something that we kind of just we put in here because we thought it was important, but we are not sure that it's something that you guys could do anything about. But essentially what the people were saying is that um, the way that it's set up, we have mostly commissioners on the board, and they said, really anyone who mentioned this said, like, our commissioners are great, but if we have a commissioner turnover, that's a huge threat for the organization. And so it's something to take note about. Um, staff turn- Turnover as well. This is more with retirements and then just kind of that loss of information. There's not a lot of um, like 
succession planning in the sense that they did that you guys did with the executive director position there's not a lot of that in other key positions and so people are just worried that information is essentially going to be walking out the door pretty soon and it has been for a while um, the informality of collaboration kind of goes with that as well we have you guys have all these partnerships and they're really great but it seems that some people who um, like Wesley and Joe talked to I didn't mm-hmm. talk to these people exactly but said that some of these are just because of like partnerships like people who know each other so if these people were to leave there's no MOU or anything formalizing these partnerships and to ensure that they continue um, and so that is something to work on as well um, the aging portfolio is probably no surprise to any of us but that is a huge issue that people listed as well as well as the reliance on um, federal funding and of course the increasing community need and so any questions about um, opportunities or threats um, before we move on? Tons of them, but I won't go <laughs> down on them. But, um, particularly threats, because we'll get into opportunities, especially in a lot more detail as we explore the, the, um, cool. the rest of this. Uh, I just want to ask a little bit about this um, board structure. Um, when I first got here, the tax board was five months. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's because the legislature said uh, that the housing agency would be governed and then by the board commission. Then Congress passed a federal law that said uh, all uh, federally funded housing agencies had to have at least two board members that resided in uh, public housing. And I volunteered to be the first one. That was not the approach the board took. Instead, they expanded the number of members of the board to two residents that lived in public housing. So even though there's there's four of the seven board members here today, two are actually born here, are public board members that live in public housing. And the rest of us are elected. So the legislature approved that change, so we're at seven. Um, the the uh, one difference between our board and say the board of lots of other housing agencies or housing programs is we're stuck with this elected official concept and so the good news is we have the buy-in of the public that elects the five four five of the five of the seven members bad news is you're right in two years, we could have uh, an over, and that's rare, but we could have uh, a turnover. We haven't had that kind of turnover. I think the most we've ever had is two seats turnover in one cycle. So, anyway, that's I thought I'd mention it. That's Thank really you. why it's listed as a threat, too. It could happen. And I think what people said, what I heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what I heard from people is that just two to five, the two residents to the five, just kind of makes it unclear. But Commissioner Sonson, you're suggesting that that's a legislative issue. It's not something that we as a board or we as a county commission. Well, I think, without I think we would have authority to go back to five, but then two of us would have to live in public housing. <laughs> and I already volunteered. <laughs> but they didn't take me up on it. So, He's on the waiting list. So. Yeah, yeah, I'm on the waiting list. So, uh, anyway, so, ooh. <laughs> anyway, I, realistically, I don't think it's going to change because there's a federal law that says it's got to be at least two, mm-hmm. or at least one, excuse me. I think we put two on so that we would have seven. I think the law is we have to have one. But we put two on so that we wouldn't have six members. I do think legally, though, what some jurisdictions can do, and I believe ours can do it too, is the jurisdiction can make a decision to have a housing authority board that doesn't have the elected officials on it. The elected officials would appoint that board. Um, But they wouldn't necessarily have to be on it. And that's not something I'm speaking emphatically about. Well, that's what they do in Portland, though. But I believe that that's the case. Isn't that what they do in Portland? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're one of the few that have a dominant elected. Is that Portland or Multnomah County? 
Um, well, the way it works in Portland is that the mayor appoints the act or the former board members, which is the Housing Authority of Portland. Um, but the Multnomah County and the city of Gresham both bring up candidates to the mayor of Portland. Um, and he, but he's the one that makes the Who has sole discretion in the membership. Okay. And I think for a long time, too, we, we all debated whether or not we wanted to put that input in because we were like, you know, this might be out of the capacity of the Board of Commissioners just to decide this. We might have to take some legislative work. Um, but enough people, enough stakeholders cited it as a possible threat. But um, I'm actually really glad to hear this conversation happen because I think that goes right really well with um, our strategic issues that we identified. And there might be a, an additional objective that we didn't add because we didn't feel we had the authority to do so. Um, but this board might be willing to do it. Any other questions before we move on into the issues themselves? Cool. All right. So speaking about issue identification, so we took this giant SWOT matrix that had you know more than 20 themes um, and put them into uh, four or what was it four strategic areas. Um, each with, or not each, but um, uh, with a total of 10 objectives. And so um, the first one is community engagement. Um, the second one is service delivery. And the third one is capacity building. And the fourth one is organizational systems. Um, we're each going to go through and describe what the strategic area um, is about. And then we're going to describe some of the key tasks and objectives that we put under those um, under those strategic issues. Uh, I think a full disclaimer is that this is not comprehensive. And I think this is why you know it's important to have the board meeting and the staff meeting to continue adding on to this strategic um, issue that we've created, uh, a, a chart that we've created. And so um, without further ado, I'll pass it on to Wesley for the first one. So the first strategic issue area that we that we recognized is um, community engagement. Um, HAXA has a pretty strong presence in the community in a lot of regards, and has more so even than presence a really strong reputation. Um, folks who know what HAXA is doing know that HAXA is doing it well. That's a powerful place to be um, in many regards. So there's more that HAXA could do. Specifically, community education in this case. Um, we're suggesting that there are community partners, land landlords, staff, um, staff of HACSA, staff of other community partners, just folks in the housing world in Eugene, Springfield, Lane County in general, uh, that could know more about how HACSA works um, in terms of where's the flexibility in how vouchers work, um, you know, how, what's the process of getting on a wait list. Things like this are things uh, that, that HACSA could take on as, as an opportunity. And for the record, all of these um, are suggestions. Um, and HAXA, the, the leadership of, of HAXA is meeting, I think, Friday to, to look into this in a lot more detail than what we're proposing here, um, especially in terms of tasks more so than objectives. Um, but yeah, workshops to, to bring these things into uh, specific uh, areas of the community to learn more. Um, Political advocacy, same kind of concept. HAXA has a really good reputation. It has a lot of folks on public housing, a lot of folks on Section 8. Um, there's, there, are, there are forums in which um, HAXA and uh, the board of HAXA could, uh, could leverage that in order to sort of increase funding, increase support for, um, for housing. Uh, we're thinking especially at the state level um, in terms of getting state funding. Um, that was a big thing that came up a number of times is HAXA could, uh, and you know this is, this is uh, probably true for any housing authority, but HAXA's got a tr good reputation. Um, HAXA could do more in terms of trying to convince the state to increase funding for housing and community services. Um, so, so there's a lot of that, and especially uh, folks referenced uh, the idea of resident services, because um, the development funds are slightly rosier than the resident services funds is the general impression that we were getting. Um, and the climate as is, the, the fact that folks are so focused on housing at the moment makes this particularly right. Um, naturally, it's kind of a tricky thing. You don't want a public entity to advocate for itself too much. Um, but I, it seemed like nobody really, I pushed a couple of people on that, and nobody seemed to really view that as a real threat. So um, branding. Uh, this is one that, that uh, it's a big category, but the basic idea is that HAXA uh, could 
could have a, a stronger brand recognition. Um, we got some jokes about the name. Um, Paxa sounds like a horror movie, you know. But it's I think more so, more so I think people were um, people were suggesting that okay, the name is not necessarily what we're talking about here. It's more so that we don't know what Haxa does aside from this clunky acronym. Um, there were folks in in um, who worked for Haxa who were like, we get calls all the time asking us, you know, how to deal with their landlord, and we're like, are you on Section Eight? And they're like, no. Not our problem, uh, but because people aren't, uh, people in the community are not 100% aware of what HAXA is. Um, there's time on the on the end of employees. There's time, um, you know, community partners dealing with questions that, with a stronger brand, might not be a problem. Um, so some things we're suggesting are making the website a little bit more user friendly, um, creating some branding material and uh, a resource packet for how to distribute that brand, um, and then designating either either hiring or potentially just sort of saying, hey, here's another responsibility on top of your 12 you've already got. Um, someone who's responsible for communications uh, at, at a strategic level um, in terms of the brand for AXA. Um, any questions about any of these three objectives? Mr. Park. Thank you. This is great. You're this is looking just like a private for profit business <laughs> board meeting right now. Okay. And, and in many ways it can. You know, there are ways it can't, obviously. Um, you know, you're talking about leveraging political advocacy and you're talking about the sensitivity of a public agency doing it for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was the director of Food for Lane County, I was also on the uh, Oregon Food Bank board, which is it's not a public agency, it's you know, it's a it's a private non profit, but it really is kind of viewed in the same light. Uh, had a powerful legislative advocacy because of it. Our food bank is highly branded. Two and three kind of wrapped together pretty nicely. And, and also highly successful in leveraging funds beyond local donations. So it, it really is, it can be powerful. And I really highly encourage it. It's, um, because we have a great product, as you've already outlined, this is a great product. And people want to hear about it. People want to uh, make it better. And people want to become a part of it. So I, I, I would view particularly number two and three. I don't fully understand number one. I'll hear more about that. But <coughs> two and three, I can see, is a real tremendous asset for the future as far as getting more people. And Hacksaw, you know, you're right. Bobby Green always called it Hacksaw. And I was wondering, Hacksaw? <laughs> Hacksaw. Um, even community partners said, like, oh, I don't usually use the acronym when I talk about the work that we do with Hacksaw. I just say, like, the Housing Authority of Lincoln County and stuff. So yeah. people mm -hmm. just... They don't use it because I think people just don't understand it. Or they're like, what? They, just, they stop listening. They're like, wait, what did <coughs> they say? Hatch <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you want to talk any more about number one? I'm going to talk a little bit about it on the next slide, on the, the employee piece. But if you want to talk about like, the rest yeah. of the landlords, okay. I, th I think for, you know, something that's important to note about the, the first point here is it's um, it's the smallest of these three. In terms of getting the message out into the community, workshops, physical events is definitely not the biggest part of what we're re recommending here. We've got one suggested task there as opposed to two to three for the other two. Um, and it's really, it's about, uh, it, it's something discrete and concrete that came up in our, in our interviews and in the focus groups as something that could be implemented. Uh, it's potentially, it's honestly potentially, it's not even a strategic question. Um, it may be more of, it, it might be uh, better to move that down into um, as a subcomponent of one of these other two. Um, now that now that that's been highlighted, actually, but it was it was really it was more so. Let's get the word out about our the function of our programs. It's less so because advocacy is about getting support for our programs, and and branding is about getting recognition for our programs. The the community education component is about how do our programs work. Um, and I think that there's a big part of that, that it, especially when it comes to private landlords, community partners, and groups like that, there's more that HACSA can be doing. I think HACSA, I think actually Jacob is the one who brought this up. Um, it, may, it may be in here directly as a result of hearing it from Jacob in one of the focus groups. Um, but it is, there's that function component that this, I think, is addressing that the other two don't quite get at. So, anyways. Any other questions about this? Um, I think that the uh, name Hacksaw or Haxa does have a certain imagery to it, and that people don't call, you know, a, a beverage that they're going to spend millions of dollars on 
They don't call it Pepsi versus Hack, so they, they call it Pepsi. Mm-hmm. And I think there is some, um, some uh, truth to uh, a, a barrier that the public or the landlords or even other elected officials and community leaders hear when they hear an acronym that they don't really recognize. And and um, we went through this uh, branding experience with um, with um, C. Valco, which was the Convention and Visitors Association of Lane County, and they changed their name after massive research to Travel Lane, and they advertised their website and their marketing as Eugene Cascades and Coats. Mm-hmm. And they went to the board of, uh, of the Springfield Chamber of Commerce and said, we, we want to change our name from Stevalco. Oh, everybody knows what Stevalco is. To uh, Eugene Cascades and Coast. They went to Commissioner Stewart's constituents in Cottage Grove and said, we want you to support a travel promotion, a, a visitor's bureau that will promote our area, and we want to change the name from an acronym you've heard of, which you could shoehorn Cottage Grove into that, and now we want you to have the name of Eugene Cascades and Coast. Doesn't even mention Cottage Grove. Doesn't even mention Commissioner uh, Bozovich's Florence. It says coast. It says coast. It doesn't say Florence. Uh, it doesn't say junction. It doesn't say, you know, Vinny. It certainly doesn't mention Springfield. It doesn't mention Springfield. And, and, and they did a lot of research on this name, uh, uh, Eugene Cascades. And this is because people outside of our area knew about these three things. This is the reason that they went to this. So they changed their acronym, which was a very bureaucratic acronym, to this newer name, in part because of the marketing. And I suspect that part of an, uh, a bureaucratic um, name, you know, uh, is in part to isolate it from the larger community because it's something you better need to know that if you don't know it you probably don't need to know it it's not something that the public in thinking okay uh, okay there's a housing problem who do I call do I call an agency with the name housing in it or do I call something else and I think that it, I, I do think that the branding then is relevant to the other things which is which is the education and, and, and that research. So making it easier for people to understand what the mission and role of the organization is. Now maybe it's like we only administer federal funds and if you have a private landlord tenant problem, please do not call us. That's a little long. You know. uh, or gee, we should have we should have a broader involvement in housing. And so, you know, housing for all uh, not to be confused with free for all. Housing for all, you know, is a little broad. So I, I do think that naming is a problem. I really do. And it was named by somebody other than me, and Jacob, and this board. 1979. <laughs> and I would just say that it is likely that I would come back to this board with a recommendation to change my name. And that wouldn't happen in the next six months, but I see that with definitely within 18, if not 12 month period of time. Anything else? So we've talked about this a little bit. Um, so one of the biggest pieces is staff training. Um, so staff training can be broken into a few different pieces. And so we talked about how um, employees mentioned that they're essentially doing a lot, of, many of them are doing a lot of social work type work without any type of social work training. And we also heard that from stakeholders that um, I guess it was more described as um, a lack of like expertise that can sometimes come off as like a lack of compassion when working with this with challenging populations um, and diverse populations in general. But it, to us, 
how we heard it, it really just seems like there's a lack of training there. And it's not it's not a lack of compassion, but it can come off that way. Um, and so training around that, um, cultural competency and working with people with marginalized needs. Um, and in addition, it was really interesting when we did our um, staff focus groups because there were people from both the Day Island and the Fairview locations. And... Um, People seemed, first of all, they had a lot to say to each other, and a lot of them didn't know each other. Um, but there was a point where one person in one of our groups just said, like, oh, it would be interesting, like, I think it would be great if, like, Hexa was able to do this, and then some other person at the table said, uh, I do that. <laughs> so <laughs> it, there's, there seems to be a lot of disconnect between the two locations, and then being able to, like, even have opportunities for employees from both locations to kind of figure out what other people are doing, because not... I mean, if all of your employees aren't clear about the services that you offer, then how are we going to get the community at large aware of that? So I thought that that was really telling. Um, and so that could be, I mean, just offering opportunities for them to engage with each other and talk about that or, like, having staff meetings for different, you know, weather for events or something like that. There's a lot of ways to go about it, but I think, and we decided that it was pretty important. That's all I have. Sure. And um, increasing accessibility of services we haven't talked about yet. Um, so that there were two different pieces, and this was mentioned less, but it was mentioned by people who would definitely know that this is an issue. And so we mentioned it anyway. And so first, the fact that most um, of the documents, actually I think all of the documents, are not available in Spanish. So that's the first issue that was mentioned. And then the fact that HAXA has, I don't know what the title is, like maybe Spanish and case management? And, but that's for people who are already in the program. And so there are a couple of those, but there's not, there aren't Spanish-speaking staff who are able to assist Spanish speakers to get into the program. And so we don't have any numbers, but we were guessing that if you were to look at the numbers of people who are being served, that um, Spanish-speaking populations are probably underrepresented. And so increasing that accessibility by, and it doesn't mean that you have to hire um, a Spanish-speaking staff person. If you're able to do that, that would be great. But maybe having some kind of contracts in place so that if you have someone who's monolingual come in, that you're able to know, you know who to call to get assistance so that they're hopefully able to get into the program. And for me, this is a big area that we need to improve, and, and we have a partnership with Centro Latino, and they're actually this week calling all the Spanish-speaking or Latino households that are on our Section 8 program and asking them a number of questions about how we're doing and what, how's the customer service that they're receiving, um, do they understand our program, and I, um, I can guarantee that there will be some areas um, that we're going to need to work on once we get the results back from those phone calls. There's a piece of the, that where the people who are already into the program, so, I mean, I, there's orientations and stuff that we talk about, like not having guests spend the night or, some, you know, things like that, um, whatever the regulations are, but not having <laughs> those things in writing in their own language is pretty hard, especially with... Um, Latinos in general have very close families, and so people will come and spend the night, and they might be, like, breaking rules and not even knowing it. So I think that that makes it hard as well. Um, any you know, I'm looking at the uh, – thank you. Uh, I'm looking at the parallel between um, uh, service delivery and um, branding. Mm -hmm. um, have, you, have you discussed that? And. Uh, Yes, we all kind of uh, we we all agreed that <laughs> there's a lot of parallel process, so that's a strategic issue. And I think we could summarize it in one big term: is communication, um, and that that's tied with branding, marketing, and increasing accessibility of services. And so we did talk about the nuances of that, but we felt that um, the accessibility of services was just slightly different enough that we would put it in a different strategic area. It deserves it. Yeah. So um, does that answer the question? It does. The uh, you know you mentioned the the discussion that you had in the employee focus group where someone said, well, I do that. Mm -hmm. Well, if that kind of lack of knowledge exists inside the system, yes. imagine how it is to your for the clients. So service delivery so many times is, uh, oh, I didn't know you did that. Mm -hmm. so. And I think we had a stakeholder who did say that, said that, you know, it wasn't that, you know, employees didn't um, want to help folks. It was that um, because there was not enough communication going on internally, it was kind of an echo chamber for, um, you know, um, stakeholders from the outside to come in and be like, wait a second, I'm, 
I've been hearing all sorts of different things. And yeah. People are telling me, yes, we do do this. And other people are saying, no, we don't do this. So. I, a parallel I would draw is that, oh, you guys sell nails, too? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, uh, a part of service delivery is people knowing how to access it. You mentioned the, by the uh, lack of uh, Spanish translation and documents. So. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We talked about, a, I think we might talk about communications a little bit later, but another thing to note, and we didn't put it in here um, because we decided that it was a communications issue, but a couple people that we've talked to said that there can, it appears sometimes that there's a lack of transparency. Um, and when we flushed that out a little bit with the people who were saying it, it just really sounds like they heard one thing from one person and then later on they heard another thing from a different person or someone they were working with, being a little complicated, but when someone else they were working with heard something that would affect the project and so they felt like there was a lack of transparency, which really to us seems really unintentional. It's just that there's a bit of a communication breakdown. Which we I think I'll get to that piece in um, my, my section too. So that's yeah. great. Um, as far as capacity building, we talked about the diversification of funding streams, and we know that as a public agency, it's very hard to fundraise, and so that's not exactly what we're suggesting, though if that's possible, great. We are suggesting um, to continue applying for different grants and also to consider, as other housing authorities do, attempting to get finance, financial backing from you know major cities, Springfield, Eugene, Lane County. Um, if possible. So, I mean, it seems to us that finding issues, it's, I mean, without being able to fundraise, there's only so much that you can do, but it should be prioritized if at all possible. Um, expanding innovative partnerships, Wesley talked about this a little bit. Everybody's, you, I mean, you're really good at partnerships, so being able to expand those can help you better serve clients. And then if we um, had maybe... I don't know, um, like mental health services or other services, drug and alcohol treatment services that were available to clients, those wraparound services, it could help people move out of housing, um, which goes with client self-sufficiency. All these things kind of go together a little bit. Um, but helping those who, we, I mean, the people we talked to, we talked to people in focus groups who said that, like, we've been in public housing for 19, 20 years, and, of course, the wait list is going to keep growing if that's the way that things are going to keep being. So if we're helping those who can and should move out of the system to do so, while at the same time people who maybe should stay in the system to age in place and stuff like that, assisting them in doing that. And again, I think it's important to, to emphasize both parts of that system. It's not get people off public housing, and it's not support people who are already on public housing. It's both at the same time. Um, and we, there were a lot of suggestions about programs that would be able to do both of those at the same time, or separate programs that would be able to do one or the other. All right, and I'm going to talk a little bit about organizational systems. Um, now, this is, again, focusing internally on how to improve um, communications internally. Um, and so this, this part, we're talking really about formalizing and monitoring um, what's going on internally within HASA. Um, and so session planning was something that came out of the employee focus groups. Um, Sarah touched on this a little bit. You know, we have a lot of institutional knowledge, like leading the organization. Um, there were people who uh, were saying uh, higher management is aware that there are some, some site managers who are the only people that know where this random pipe might be, right? And if this person were to retire them tomorrow, no one would be able to find this simple thing anymore. Um, and so we decided that um, maybe creating desk manuals is a, a good option for um, HACSA, is to create desk manuals or some other method of transferring knowledge for all unique positions with HACSA. I think this would also address some of the employees who said to us, you know, I feel like I got promoted, but now I'm doing my old job and my new job. And so I, I, the promotion is really, I just have more responsibility. Um, and so I think that would be also a great way to pass on um, knowledge to, you know, if you're hiring someone else to replace you while you got promoted, um, handing them a desk manual saying, you know, this is, you know, something that you need to start on day one or these are things you need to maintain um, while you're here. 
Um, there was also a talk about formalizing partnerships that were initiated by staff. Everyone, as a strength, you know, a lot of, a lot of people said, you know, our staff was compassionate, very passionate about housing, and um, some of these staff, you know, would go out of their way to establish partnerships with local nonprofits to, um, you know, get people out of uh, public housing or off of Section 8, and um, if these uh, folks retire, then there's no formal MOU, and nobody else in the organization is aware that all this work has gone into establishing a partnership with all these nonprofits, and so writing, uh, uh, teaching staff how to write MOUs or formalizing MOUs so that everybody is aware that, hey, HACSA has established this new partnership with this organization, so if you're looking for this type of service, um, this is who you can go to. Uh, so that was, but that was part of succession planning. Um, and then the second piece here is about clarifying policies and procedures. So this, again, is like the, the piece about how do we get staff to communicate with each other and how do we get, uh, how do we make sure that everyone is speaking the same language and is on the same page within HACSA. Uh, so one of the suggestions that we had was just mapping out communication networks and new communication channels, letting staff know, okay, if you have information to convey, this is the channel you must go through. Um, and then also formalizing those triggers. So if someone makes a, a small change to a policy, uh, saying, you know, if you make a decide to make a small change to a policy to improve service, you must communicate this to X, Y, and Z. Um, because that, that was something that the residents were saying. They were confused about the, their home checks. You know, some, some folks thought home checks meant just, we're going to see if the windows work and if the pipes are working fine. And other folks were like, no, I've been told I need to clean my entire house before you come in. You know, and so um, there was a lot of confusion about that. And I think that's uh, really impacting residents and their quality of life while they're um, in the program. Um, and so that, that, came, that was something that came out really strongly in my focus groups. Um, and then I would also ask, uh, not ask, but uh, suggest that uh, we have to ensure that all current internal policies and procedures are available easily on the on the uh, intranet. Um, a lot of that came out of the employee focus group. Employees were saying that um, there's no where no one place that they can go to to find out more information about these things. Um, so that was something that came out. Um, and then finally, employees expressed concern and worry for their other employees, saying that there's no emergency or crisis plan. And so you know in light of all these terrible shootings that are happening across the nation, what if some something crazy were to happen? You know, there was concern for front um, front desk staff about where do we go, what do we do, um, and other emergencies, whether that's natural disasters or whatnot. And so, um, I think if the, there probably is already a plan in place, but that isn't disseminated to employees. And so, uh, whether that means creating one and then disseminating, or just disseminating the current one, would be a good good option for us. Any questions about this? Yes. All right, so um, the last recommendation that we have is about how to implement this strategic plan. Um, as we had kind of touched about a little bit earlier, um, this is not comprehensive, and we know that we only have information that we were able to get from 10 weeks of research. Um, and I think all the commissioners and everybody sitting in this room has way more knowledge than we as consultants might have coming from the outside. Uh, however, we do have a few uh, next step recommendations about how to best implement this plan. Um, one is reporting to the strategic plan to stakeholders, so this is the, board, uh, the working board meeting um, today, and then I think there's a staff meeting that's happening on Friday, both Wesley and I will be present to uh, take notes and try to help um, facilitate some of that process to add additional tasks. Uh, a lot of the tasks that we suggested are, might be seen more like short-term, six to 12 month um, tasks, and so we're looking really for um, 18 to you know, 26, uh, 20, 21 um, sort of tasks to implement. Um, so that, yes, we'll be working on finalizing the task list next. Uh, we also have a little bit of a recommendation about a tracking system that's to be decided by the board and by staff about how um, this might work best. Uh, this is something that we took from our meeting with higher management, right? So it was interesting. Um, some folks are saying, I love the old strategic plan. It guides me in all of my work. And other folks are saying, I felt like I was not involved in this. I didn't go to, I didn't get invited to meetings. I felt it was like something totally separate from my line of work. Um, and so that's why we pointed out, you know, it might be good to discuss, you know, is having monthly meetings to update about progress better, or should we have uh, implement an online project management system so that everyone sees um, tasks as they are being completed live and that everybody knows where to go to if you want to see how the strategic plan is working. Um, but I think the, uh, another con of having an online pro uh, project management system is that folks are saying we don't really have an interest on that yet, so I'm not sure exactly how that would work, but it's something for um, the board and the organization to discuss as a whole. Any questions about next steps? 
Can I just make one editorial comment? So, um, um, so Sarah Jopa and Wesley, um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very, very impressed with the amount of information that they took in and understood our business lines and brought back um, some advisement and content for us that really gives us a, a path going forward. Um, our business is... Um, complex and they could have um, taken on some of the other um, nonprofits in their class that would have been much easier. <laughs> so I just wanted to make sure that you knew that they went the extra mile and really jumped into a very complex organization and brought us that information that was exceptionally impressive. Well, I hope you all get outstanding that bounce the news out this um, thank you very much. I thought this was really, really useful for us as a board, and I just wanted to um, reiterate how thorough I thought you were with the interviews and with the, uh, you know, acquiring information to have a basis. Because we didn't, we had a lot of people to come in here and give us their perspective on on this agency, and um, and they usually don't take the time, and they don't usually have the. Uh, the quality of the information that, that you acquired. So I think the, the, your recommendations on what to do are formulated in part by how thorough all that was. I'm wondering if there's any way of sharing that uh, fact-finding. In other words, I could tell from my own experience here that you guys had done a lot of work on that. But I'm wondering, since... You know, you're talking to a bare majority of the seven member hacks of board, and three of the hacks of board members aren't here, four are, and the good news is that four got to hear the presentation. But for those people in the community that are advocates for the agency, and for those people in the community that they want to know more about it, and for the board members themselves to get some more detail on the actual fact gathering. You mentioned all the strengths and, and weaknesses and interviewing lots of people to give their perspective on, on all that. Uh, how, how can you protect the anonymity of the people that responded to all these questions but still convey the information to the public and to the and to the uh, four board members that are here and to the three board members that are here. And for future board members, because we do appoint the public board members and the public elects the uh, public board members. So for future board members, how would you do that? So I think, I think pulling out one critical component that you mentioned, which is anonymity, we did, um, in our conversations with stakeholders, we did tell them, um, and many of them said, well, I don't care, but we don't know for certain who those people are when we look at our raw data. Um, but we did tell them, your information will be protected. We will make sure that um, the, the exact words you say will not be attributed back to you. Mm -hmm. um, and so our raw data is disaggregated already. Um, yeah. So if, if we were to get, give it to you at the moment, um, you know, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have names associated with it. But just because it's disaggregated doesn't mean it's not identifiable. There's a lot of identifiable information in that. I, I, the reason I'm asking is that, that the work you've done isn't just, uh, you know, uh, uh, important today. It'll be important for a long time in the future. And for, for, for uh, board members to be able to uh, look at what people in the community were saying in a very organized fashion, you guys, will be very valuable. And I don't mean to put you on the spot about how do you protect the anonymity of the people versus the anonymity of every single bit of information that they provided. And I'm enough of a lawyer to say there is a difference between mm -hmm. the information provided and the and the name and address and and and, and the usual likely times of day that they are home, uh, <laughs> and what religion they have and what other information about them. And there is a way in my mind to separate the individual and, 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 and specifically promised uh, anonymity of their name uh, versus uh, providing the public and the 
and the commissioners with the sum total of the observations of all of these uh, stakeholders. I think to um, in, in our strategic plan, we as we would uh, on the presentation we just listed bullet points, but in our strategic plan we provided one to two sentences description of what we heard and um, just kind of a summary of the theme that came out of um, the interviews that we had. So maybe that will help a little bit to kind of disseminate to future um, commissioners and future EDs that you know this is the strategic plan that happened. This is um, the information that the consultants found out without you know avoiding you know without harming anyone's confidentiality or other mm-hmm. uh, So. So I think one of the things that we can do, so we meet with our management team this Friday, and um, I think we can send out this or a version close to this to all the folks we interviewed and invite them to send that out to their networks as they see fit and just um, tell folks that if they had any additional input, um, that they could send it back to us. Our current trajectory is to, um, I think it was in Wesley's network in the next step slide, our current trajectory would be to come back to you January 12th with a you know, finalized strategic plan so we could give folks a couple weeks to send us some the final input. Um, if we started getting a flood of input that um, made us rethink that, we could always come back a couple you know, a couple weeks later in January if necessary. So does that sound be like a good approach to follow? Yes. Mm-hmm. We plan to send the raw data to you too, okay. but I think, especially if we have till January 12th, like I don't, I could go through that and know there. So there's like, there are very few comments because they're so, so, so many of them are so similar that I, I think there are very few that are specific enough that you would know who or even what sector that comment came from. And so I can just look through those, delete those, and we can just send it to you. And you could have like the spreadsheet delete, but I could also like put it into a different format so it'd be easier to look at the at the moment, what we've got is a very large Excel file, yeah. which is essentially here's the themes, mm-hmm. and here's everything about the it. versions of it that were said, and in some cases, is up to you know, as we mentioned, 30 mm-hmm. examples of the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're we're going to make that available to Jacob and Valerie, but we have to go through and check it first mm-hmm. to, to ensure exactly it's not anonymity, it's um, confidentiality. Well, yeah, more so than than anonymity. Because, I mean, we, we talked with a lot of people, and in every case we said, we're going to make sure that you are not... Uh, that you are, that you are not identified as the person who said these things. We want these things to be conveyed, but we don't necessarily want them to be tied to you. For example, we don't necessarily want to know Cornerstone Community Housing's Executive Director Richard said this. We just want to know what he said, um, and, and we don't even want to know. You know, and we want it to be aggregated with everything else. And that's how it is, but we need to confirm that before we release the data. So. Um, uh, Jacob, I'm really pleased for this. A great presentation. Um, and not only a great presentation, but a great uh, docu- so, um, document that you've produced. Um, kind of, obviously, there's a great deal more data than you put forward in your presentation, uh, a great deal more information than you put in this document. I'm excited to see more of it. I'm excited to see how you're able to use the Excel file to kind of manipulate the data and the things that really are usable on the front line. I'm uh, once again, highly impressed. I am really pleased with, that, with, with what we've heard today. So, board members, thank you so much for your time and attention uh, to this topic today. What we specifically wanted to leave here with were um, your impressions of our um, overarching strategic goals. Jacob had seven. The consultants were able to um, sort of generalize those more down to four overarching strategic categories. But also, if you had any um, thoughts or ideas about tasks that we would insert under, you know, as they to do under these strategic categories that we would assign and put a time frame with. We would love to have those suggestions from you. And also, if you have uh, feedback about our process, so you understand what the process has been up until now, and you've heard a couple times that we're going to meet on Friday with all of our staff, and then we'll be back here in January. So if you have any feedback, I'm not sure if you're allowed to email Jacob uh, or, or what the what the way to do it would be, but we want to hear your thoughts too. We do our best work working on the <laughs> I, I just want to, you know, I've spoken much, but I just want to say that, you know, I, I went down the, the 
the four strategic issues as they, as they have them and the sub tasks they have underneath that. And I thought you guys captured a lot of my concerns very well. Um, I, I don't have anything I would really add. And, and you have captured some things I hadn't thought of that obviously came out of other interviews. Um, so I, I think the team did an excellent job um, with the interviews and then boiling that down um, into you know, some, some strategic goals and, and a strategic plan, um, you know, doing that that work from just generalized interviews all the way back, you know, working into, you know, what are the issues, what are the opportunities, and then working that into a plan that did a great job with that. So, I, you know, I don't disagree with, with, with the way they set this out, and I think, I think the format's really done well. I'll be interested to see if there's anything added by staff um, or not when it comes back to us, I guess, for a final approval of, of the plan. Um, but as it stands right now, I can't think of anything I would add. I think the guys have done a fantastic job. And that, that are, those are my comments, too. I, you guys did an excellent presentation. The report is excellent. Um, captured all the thoughts that I had, which were many. I'm sure I was frantically <laughs> taking notes. So, uh, um, but I, I really believe that um, this is a... Uh, this is a great product, and the report down, and I'm anxious to see it and uh, get it adopted in January and, and uh, get to work on it. Uh, Axis former strategic plan, um, it's amazing what was in it. As, as you kind of indicated, I think when I first saw it and, and supported it, it, it was pretty daunting. I mean, it's huge. And, uh, I was always impressed with the reports that we got and, and the work, and I, and I really felt that uh, that plan, it, as detailed as it was and aggressive as it was, it really guided some great work in this organization. And I think it's still another level, and I, and I believe that this is going to build on it and improve in areas that, that need to be improved. So thank you very much. One, it reminded me of one other thing I wanted to comment on, and that was the question about how do we you know, make this a living document and continue the reporting so staff understands that. We've done a, our, our, as, as a board, as, a, as our other board, right, um, we have a strategic plan also, and we get quarterly reports on that strategic plan from staff as to the progress. And those quarterly reports basically take you know, these goals, and they have basically, you know, completed would be green. It's a nice dark green they have. Or if they're close to completing them, they're kind of a light green. If they're just kind of moderating them, it's yellow. If they're, if, they're, if they're really not going anywhere, they might have a red color on them, you know, or something like that as a warning. But it's kind of an easy way for, in a quarterly manner, for a board to kind of you know, almost a dashboard sort of thing go, where, where, are we, where are we with this stuff and where is it going? And staff having to do that quarterly review forces at least the administrative staff to look at that, and that report being available for the rest of staff to see kind of is an easy thing, easy, quick way for folks to see how we progress on our strategic plan. And then, you know, and then on top of that, on an annual basis, we're looking at is there stuff we can take off now that we've completed it, and is there tasks we need to add? We just we just had a work session yesterday actually on our strategic plan to do that annual look at those tasks as a board. So um, if that's you know it's got to be a living document. It can't just sit on a shelf. Um, and I think you know quarterly reporting on progress is one of the ways of forcing that and, and, and in, in an easy format to communicate to everyone, you know, the community, the board, and staff. One thing I forgot to mention is that Char, Revis, and Hugh were both really involved throughout the strategic plan process. Um, Char was actually came very ill yesterday and had to go to the hospital. She's doing fine, and I frankly, along with another staff member, encouraged her to stay at home today. I know she's watching live, and I just want to make sure that you guys know that both of our uh, appointed commissioners have been heavily involved in the process. I think Commissioner Wright won't be here, but he had a 7 o'clock meeting in Salem and was going to try and make the drive down in time and test the game just before 9 to say he was just leaving, so he's probably showing up in the garage right about now. 
time. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Yes, thank you. Just the beginning of the work, though, right? Right. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> We have one more item. Oh, one more item. Uh, can't leave yet. Uh, item B, which is uh, an update on our cornerstone partnership and the next steps. Great. Um, so I'd like to invite um, Richard Herman, Executive Director of Cornerstone, and Rick Larson, their board chair, to the table to share in this discussion with us. Um, so just to uh, tee up this conversation, I'll, I'll say a few words. Um, so um, in our November work session, in the November HACSA board work session, um, we talked about uh, a partnership discussion we've been having with Cornerstone. Um, and um, in that work session, I talked about the fact that we had established a nonprofit, I think it was about two years ago. Um, that nonprofit is um, still uh, legally operating, but I would say that that nonprofit isn't, um, isn't an active nonprofit at this time. The original intent of uh, creating that uh, nonprofit, Housing Plus, was to uh, position HACSA to do fundraising and grant writing to expand resident services um, throughout our housing portfolio. Um, one of the things that I know just from being active in the nonprofit world, as many of you have been, is that developing a nonprofit from the ground up and um, establishing a brand and a name for a nonprofit and getting it to a place where it can, can raise funds and pursue grants in a sophisticated manner takes a lot of time and a lot of money. Um, HACSA and Cornerstone started uh, a deliberate partnership um, when we um, began pre-development activity around our project, Linwood Place. Um, and that partnership worked really well for both organizations, and we continue to work on that partnership um, as we continue to work on Glenwood Place through the pre-development process. Um, but as I explained in our work session in early November, um, uh, for me, um, I'm a little bit hesitant to start a nonprofit from the ground up because uh, of a couple factors. One, I think I'm going to be very busy and the organization is going to be very busy over the next couple of years with real estate development and with repositioning our portfolio and with managing our large federal programs through you know, the volatile federal funding uh, challenges that we face. Um, and at the same time, Richard and I started talking more deliberately about, well, what would a partnership between our organizations look like so that HACSA would have access to um, an organization or an entity that has a fundraising capacity and grant writing capacity. Um, so throughout last summer, um, Richard and I led uh, an effort to really look at what does a more deliberate partnership look like. Um, and Rick participated in a number of those meetings and Char and Hugh also participated in a number of those meetings. Um, and really, um, those meetings were focused on, is there, is there any there there here? Is there any potential here? Um, and um, we, we believe that there is potential here, and we believe that this partnership um, should enter into the next step of due diligence. Um, and, and ultimately, um, if that due diligence process um, pans out the way we think it will, there would be some sort of a formal agreement between the two organizations to partner on expanding housing opportunities throughout um, the region. Um, one of the things, um, Commissioner Swanson, that I heard loud and clear from you in the last um, work session was how would this impact other partnerships that HACSA has with shelter care, with sponsors, uh, with Laurel Hill, and I could go on because we partner with many organizations. And Richard and I have talked about that quite a bit back and forth since um, the work session where we received that feedback from you. Um, and, um, 
we really uh, think that it doesn't create any negative potential partnership opportunities with other organizations. And in fact, we think um, our partnerships with our other organizations could be stronger because of a more deliberate partnership between the two organizations. So we actually had um, sent to you a, a pretty detailed memo with a, a fair amount of information and recommendations in it. Um, and actually, won't go through um, the details, but I'll touch on a couple of high points, and then I would just um, uh, ask Richard and Rick to make any um, additional comments that they'd like to make. Um, but, um, you know, both organizations have um, good uh, real estate portfolios, and, and the thinking here is instead of us developing um, separate capacity around development and asset management, is there a way to kind of collectively work as one team and look across um, both portfolios. So that's kind of one uh, rationale for um, our alliance. Um, and then, as I mentioned, um, Cornerstone is, is a recognized um, brand, and they have a fundraising and um, grant writing infrastructure that if we don't partner with them, we're going to have to go purchase. And what that purchasing of that infrastructure would look like could could look a couple different ways. Um, so one of the things I thought maybe, Richard, you could touch on was just um, you've actually um, had a, a number of successful partnerships, and, and including one exciting one that I haven't had time to brief the board on, but that's mm -hmm. just around expanding um, kind of health care yes. um, supports and full mm -hmm. portfolios. Yes. So I'm going to comment briefly, and then Rick's got a 10.30 that he needs to go to, so I'm going to let Rick add to the back on your two. So uh, just briefly, though, on, on what we've already done together uh, is, you know, we started in 1992, so we've been a, a long-term organization. And uh, over time, as, as Jacob said, we built uh, a really quality portfolio, but we also built a lot of strengths around the resident services side, which is a big component of doing fundraising because people, especially foundations, are more, more likely to give to that cause than to buildings themselves, and we can finance building in other ways. So we have built uh, both the strong resident services program and the fundraising capacity. Uh, most recently, what we uh, know, and some of you have come to our events about home matters, and we did last year home matters to education and home matters to health care. Uh, but on the health care arena, uh, we uh, two years ago got a grant from the Enterprise Foundation, which is a national foundation, to look at how uh, health care and housing connects, and more specifically, to get uh, recognizing that healthcare costs for the healthcare system, uh, the people that are the heaviest users are often people who are at lower incomes and have more healthcare issues. And so, getting them connected to primary care physicians and getting help when they need it, dealing with immunization, dealing with uh, things like uh, you know diabetes, which is related to diet, as you know. And so. On. so so we've been, we've been focusing on that. We got a grant from Enterprise. They renewed again. Uh, and the biggest grant, we, and Pacific Source was another one that is locally that's given us grant money to uh, put health care workers uh, that are in our facilities, and not only for our residents, but we can reach out to neighborhoods as well. Uh, and then the biggest one is Trillium, uh just provided a grant to us. Uh, we... Um, they, they see the direct benefit, and they're actually doing the tracking and measuring outcomes. So we're taking a base of people that are in our properties and looking at health care costs because they've got access to all those records, and they're going to be tracking them from the time that people move in to the time that they move out or in future years, what's the health care cost look like. So it's going to be a, a really, really important part and also another way of looking at how do we finance uh, the resident services program. How do we get those costs better because they are expensive? Let me stop there if I may and have Rick comment. So, yes, the lead. Well, I'm sorry to be somewhat abrupt, but some of you may know Cornerstone. We have a very strong board. Uh, it was founded initially by Gene Tate. And so it has as its identity sort of this entrepreneurial approach to trying to solve social problems. 
And I think if you look at all the different issues that face people of this community or any community, you come back to the fact that if they don't have good housing, then all you're doing is putting band-aids on things. Mm -hmm. You cannot take care of people's mental health issues, their nutrition issues, their um, education of their children, and juvenile delinquency. Everything comes back to having a stable home environment. So I'm a believer <laughs> in having housing be a very central part of uh, what the community needs to support. And how that gets done is certainly the public sector piece, huge public sector piece. But you also have an education problem as far as taxpayers believing that this is a wise use of resources. Uh, we think that the private sector, or I don't really think of nonprofits as being private sector per se, but they do have more of a private sector perspective on some things. Uh, we do believe that uh, we can access people and get them to understand just how this is an excellent way for, for finding your, your charitable dollar um, or just supporting it in general, whether it is with donations or their, their political approach to what's important in this community. So we're excited about the opportunity of working with a government organization such as HACSA. We think that there is something that we can bring to bear that will be helpful. Um, we've also, with experience, found that the resident services things have been touched on have been a, a huge element of not simply putting roots over somebody's heads, but actually having them be successful in that environment. Some of these people come from a very fractured world. And if they can build community, get connected, and have their children get connected, have their children want to bring their children, their friends home to their place, it builds a, a future that isn't really being accomplished by just simply uh, keeping them out of brain. Mm -hmm. we, we believe that there's much more to the story, and uh, that's a big part of our mission. That's, that's a great um, perspective. Um, we were able to tour the mission last week, and it was the same exact message. I mean, they, yeah, they're there to meet the immediate need, but the ultimate goal is to bring the services necessary to get them into stable housing. And so, you know, it's just not one component. It's not just having a place to stay. You have to be able to you know, serve the folks and help them with their specific needs, whatever it might might be. And so it's encouraging to hear you know, the partnership with the healthcare and I'm sure you have other partners with all the other providers that provide a myriad of services and that's really what we're just gonna have to continue to link ourselves together with these services to to be effective with actually helping somebody become self sufficient and you know, be able to be productive and, and meet the needs. We, when we build our projects, we have a community room because I, we've always thought of this as sort of a, a platform for which other services can be delivered. We do not bring them food and nutrition, but food for Lake County does. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other uh, providers that come and, and present some. Uh, classes for education, nutrition, uh, job searching, any a, a wide variety of different things that can be uh, brought to the people there by, because of the, of the physical structure that's created. You know, Rick, I think you said something that can be a, almost a mantra for us all. It's building your future. It's more than just keeping them out of the rain. And that goes for the mission. It goes for Cornerstone. It goes for uh, providing the types of services that you're describing, the nutrition, uh, health care services, behavioral health care services, a uh, casework in general. You know, uh, Jack Tripp gave me another mantra that he talks about all the time. It's uh, housing, casework, and wet beds. And we've not really talked about how wet beds fit into this. We may not so much today, but understand that 
that is an integral part of our housing, both of my housing needs. But I'll say very briefly, the thought of this partnership makes my heart beat. It really does. Why? Wow, it's strong. I mean, it's, uh, exciting. it's exciting. You've described a partnership that you already have with other non-profits, for instance, with Cohen County and some other uh, housing provider non-profits. To me, in, uh, weaving this network where when you do something, you know about it. When you do something, you know about it. And because you know about it, everybody knows about it. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, it's just a, it's like a spider web. You touch one part of it and the whole thing shakes. It's, uh, I'm really excited about it. Mm-hmm. So, so that Rick might need to dash, but the other thing that's, that's embedded in here that's a little bit beyond fundraising and resident services um, that I would draw your attention to is um, in our work session in early November, I shared with you what's going on with our real estate portfolio. And um, we have some big challenges in front of us to reposition that portfolio. And one of the other elements of this partnership, again, could be using the Cornerstone Board as the Hacks of Board's Real Estate Advisory Committee. Um, I feel a little bit, well, I'm cautious about how much time I take, particularly from the elected Hacks of Commissioners, because you guys have jobs far beyond affordable housing. Um, I feel the need to have a group focus on our real estate in a much more um, deliberate and um, time-bound way, so that could be a, a monthly meeting where I could tap into the expertise of real estate professionals like Rick and Harris Hoffman's on the board, and they have a few folks representing the banking world. Um, because it's really going to be intense, perhaps, uh, over the next couple of years in terms of the number of um, different uh, financings that we're going to have to put together for new construction and for repositioning the portfolio. So, again, we can come back in more detail on that, but I wanted you to, I know you read it, but that is part of um, what we would look at as part of the process. I just want to say uh, I'm very excited about this relationship because I think that uh, you, you've heard uh, bits and pieces of, of, of our uh, previous effort at, at establishing a nonprofit. And I think that it was um, a good idea to try to establish that, but I think that the barriers of starting a nonprofit in such a complex field, and I mean complex in the sense that the professionals that run this agency, not the board, but the professionals that run this agency have to put their primary focus on the compliance with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, requirements of, of who gets the money, how much they get, what they use it for, how they document what they use it for, and how they defend themselves in the event there's any dispute over an audit of how they use the funds. And so there's a huge amount of work that is way beyond the expertise of any of us in various other lives that we have that has to be done by this agency and is crucial. But we know as, as leaders, we know that this problem is not being solved by a declining amount of federal funding going into housing agencies across this country. And a lot of people of various types want something done. And I think the exciting part, and I say more done, <laughs> Uh, the exciting part of this relationship is we know that nonprofits have also really matured in this country in the last 25 years. You know, we might have had uh, uh, a small number of nonprofits. Now it's a big component of the economy, particularly of Eugene and Springfield, my county. So it's it's a it's a an opportunity where we've had a phenomenal track record with, with the housing agency in terms of their use of the funds and their awards and the, and the lack of, of, of energy, negative energy by the federal government toward them. So we have a very well-performing agency. But the community knows that, you know, we're not doing enough. We've got the we've got the the annual reports that these school districts put put out mm-hmm. about the thousands, not dozens, thousands of children that are homeless in this in this community. So it, it's not just, of course, those homeless people. It's also all the underserved people. And I think in Multnomah County and other places where they've had co-location of public housing facilities with libraries or other public institutions or nonprofits, uh, it's always been 
to the benefit of the people we are trying to serve. So when, when Mr. Larson talked about, oh, uh, we're not providing the food, well, you know, we know that a uh, very low percentage of these, a very high percentage of people have low educational attainment. They need continuing education. They need drop, job training. They need, um, uh, you know, public library services. They need job services. They need all these kinds of things. And, and you're right, the only place that you can find them as a group would be in the morning when they wake up at a facility either that you built or one of your partners have built or that Max has built. And to me, it's, it's, it's really great. And I don't know what the detail is going to be. Uh, if there are, are any problems with the detail, I'll just say my good offices are open to, uh, to help me to resolve whatever details there are. But I think the exciting part is is the synergistic effect that will occur. I hate to depart for this, but it's uh, been wonderful for your time and certainly your, your interest. This is a really important thing. I get a lot of opportunity here. Thank you. 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 With obviously, this is a work session, but um, what we did today was just wanted to bring this back before you and let you know that we would come back and ask for your authorization to enter into that next due diligence period. This is not a done deal, but it looks very positive from our perspective. We would want a formal board order that sort of blesses us to go into that next phase. That's good. Thank you. Great. And I'm going to get myself into it, and I, I just want to say, um, you know, thank you for all the support this board has done and the board has done over time for, for housing. There was a point that you, there was more opportunities for funding when road funds were available and so on, but, you know, the, the support of the county has been phenomenal. And I already said my uh, great comments about uh, Jacob at the time you were making your decision to appoint him, but uh, the, the leadership he's providing, not only in our community, but at the state level, uh, is, is really outstanding in this collaborative effort and working with, as you're concerned about, you know, how does this impact other agencies? Uh, even before Jacob, Larry Abel was, <clears throat> was in a leadership role of getting other providers to work together. It's going to be a really healthy thing when we're not competing with each other for a million dollars, but we're collaborating together to maximize those dollars. So, thank you. And Rick is with Harang Long, right? Sorry? Rick is with Harang Long. Uh, he's with uh, Eugene. Uh, he's told it. Well, I'm not sure. Let's see. I can't remember the name. His email is Eugene Law, but uh, he, he recently changed it. Yeah. Yes. So we don't, we don't have an executive section. Is there any further business? I'd just like to say thank you. This was uh, very productive. I know the other members would have liked to have been here. Hopefully they'll take the time to watch the presentations and, and look forward to these items coming back to us after the first year. Thanks. Thank you.